Hey everyone, and welcome to the Dice Tower. I'm Camilla. And today we're going to kick off my top 100 games of all time. Now I did this list a year ago at this point, I think, right? Maybe a little over a year ago. And I will say there's quite a bit of change. There's some new entries just because they're new games. There's other ones that I feel like I've grown and maybe my taste have changed a little bit as, as a gamer. Other ones have fallen off maybe just because I've seen everything that they, I feel like I've experienced everything I want to in that game. But this list is my top 100, the games that I'm almost always willing to play, but I'm definitely always willing to talk about. So my number 91 through 100, let's get started. Number 100, King of Tokyo. King of Tokyo to me is really unique in the way that it brings to light this Yahtzee mechanism. You know, you have a group of dice and you can re-roll re -roll them up to three times, choosing what you want to keep and ultimately resolving them after the three re-rolls or the two re-rolls, three rolls total. And it brings it into this multiplayer battle arena kind of style game that's just really unique. It's quick, it's punchy, it works at high player counts, which is great for me because I'm not typically a fan of a party game. If I'm going to play a party game, this is the type I want to. This game hits the table over and over again with my family, with my son, with my friends, as a filler, as a large group, just in so many different arenas that this game just shines. And I think for that, it's really unique. It's a comfortable Yahtzee mechanism. It is a lot of fun thematically, just getting to choose your big monster and seeing that massive standee and kind of putting it on the board. It just feels very uh, epic, you know, right out of the gate. And you're, just the tension that's, that's with those Yahtzee rolls is just, to me, very unique to this game. And for that, King of Tokyo is my number 100. Number 99. Summer camp. Now, growing up, I went to summer camp every year. I also was a very out, a part of an outdoorsy family, so we did a lot of hiking and camping and things like that. I have five brothers, and they're all Boy Scouts, so they have lots of those skills, and we're always kind of working on their different merit badges, uh, which inevitably meant I was working on them too somehow. But summer camp, this game really brings all this to the front of my mind. It's a very nostalgic game, and I think the artwork really sells it as well because it has has this almost paper crafted look to it. So it's very pretty and very engaging, but it has this, again, this nostalgic feel. It reminds me of a craft that I would have done back at summer camp. I love that the cards, the different action cards that you're, that you're building your deck up with are, are things that I have a connection to as well. I grew up with the tire swing. I grew up making friendship bracelets, you know, at, at summer camp and things like that, and always came home with those new undying friendships, right? That, uh, inevitably fell by the wayside. But you know, for those two months, they were great. So to me, Summer Camp is just such a nostalgic game that's, that's based on great mechanisms as well. The deck building is great. It has this good tension and race feel to it that just keeps it bring, coming back to the table. And so for that, Summer Camp is my number 99. Number 98, Ghost Fight and Treasure Hunters, which isn't here, but this has ghosts. I think Ghost Fight and Treasure Hunters hit me in the same way that King of Tokyo did. And by that, I mean it is a mechanism that I'm comfortable with, that I grew up with, in this case, roll and move, that is done really well and uniquely. And I think because Ghost Fight and Treasure Hunters is a cooperative game, you're still feeling like you're making meaningful decisions to mitigate or to work with the dice that are, that are rolled. So you might get a really low roll, or you might roll an extra ghost, or you might bust out on trying to... Um, capture that ghost, but you, it feels tactical because you're working together and because there's multiple things that you can do. You're trying to balance getting the gems, getting them out of the, of the castle here, as well as taking the ghost out and keeping that manageable. So because of all those meaningful decisions you're making, it feels like you're tactically uh, responding to the dice rather than just kind of in this spiral of whoever has the best luck wins. So with that, Ghost Fight and Treasure Hunters, I've really enjoyed my time with this game and it is my number 98. My number 97, Karuba. 
Karuba has one of my favorite styles of playing in it, and that is where it is open or equal information. So in Karuba specifically, you all have the same tile each round that you're trying to place, and ultimately the winner comes down to who most efficiently uses what they are given each turn. So it does have that bingo feel to it, but at the end of the day, again, it's not luck that wins. It's who uses that best and most efficiently. You're all working with the same information pool. You're all working with the same options. But what corner did you back yourself into and how do you respond to that? And I love that decision space. I love the tension that this game brings as you're seeing your neighbor who maybe did it a little bit differently. You're like, oh, that was a good move. Hold on, how can I make this work for me now with what I'm looking at? And I love that of this game. So for that, my Karuba is number 97. Number 96, Dog Park. Dog Park is unique and kind of a surprise to me, not because of the theme. I love dogs. I love animals. I love studying them. I love their individual personalities, but because it has this auction or this bidding aspect to it, and I am not a fan of these games. So what I think it does really well though in this auction and bidding is you always get something. You have open information. There's, there's three or four or five cards out there depending on the player count. So you see what all the options are and your decision is how much or how much do you care about winning a specific card and how much can you react to what other players have already bid to. I really, really enjoy that aspect of it. And I think that at the end of the day, because it's an auction game, that that first part of it is auction and you're responding to what cards you get, making a decision on how much to put into it, how much to kind of wager. And then the second half of the game, when you're actually going through the park and you're collecting resources to build up for next round, there's enough planning and strategy that I think that that first part that would typically bother me in games doesn't in this one. In fact, I think it really sells this game for me. I love the theme. I love the individual cards of this and learning about the different dog breeds. Um, I really like the joint nature of that auction, trying to get out there and get that breed that you need, really nail that walking contract that you're after, and then going through the park and again, trying to make certain points before other players to get what you need, that plan ahead is just really, really well done in this. And I always look forward to play it and kind of um, testing out new strategies, you know, going really heavy into one breed or kind of varying myself. I really like the scope of what this game can do with those two mechanisms combined. So for me, number 96 is Dog Park. Number 95, Herbaceous. Of this group of 91 to 100, Herbaceous is absolutely my soothing game. This is the one that every time I pull it out, it just leaves me feeling good and happy and relaxed at the end. So maybe it is a soothing and relaxing game. I love the artwork, the simplicity of it. The mechanisms are very comfortable with this set collection, but it still is has interesting enough decisions on when do you lay down and, and plot or pot your um, herbs and when do you hold on to them pushing for that just one more in there. It has really good player interaction, I think, with the communal garden out in the front. Again, kind of that little bit of push your luck and read your opponent's feel to it but not enough where I would call the game confrontational. And so because of those things, because of the artwork, because of the theme, and because of these comfortable mechanisms, um, this is just my soothing game. And I really enjoy it. It's definitely one that I play a lot late at night or kind of that end of the night just to kind of round out game night. It's one of my go-tos. So for that, number 95 is Herbaceous. Number 94, Gloomhaven, Jaws of the Lion. From the very first time I played Gloomhaven Jaws the Lion, I knew I was in for a treat. I remember first the first play, which is part of the tutorial system, but that first play, when I sat down about halfway through, I was like, oh, I like this. Oh, this part reminds me of blank game. This game, this part reminds me of this game. And what was really unique and interesting about it is while it reminded me of these games, it's not like it took that and did it better. It just blended it really well. I love the narration in this game. I love that you get involved and attached to your character and in the developing story, one, the narrative of the actual story, but two, in your own character's development as they progress and as they grow and get new items and things like that. I love those two things together, but the narration doesn't get in the way of the gameplay. I would not say this is a storytelling or a narrative game. It just has that element. Ultimately, this game is a puzzle of your cards and you have to cooperate in order to have success. I really enjoy that balance 
um, I guess kind of the balance of those two mechanisms in this game. It has great card play. It has great cooperation. It also has a really good story that you're invested in. And so for that, number 94 is Gloomhaven Jaws of the Lion. Number 93, get on board, New York and London. Get on board, New York and London is not one that draws me in because of the theme, but it is truly just the mechanisms of it. This seems like a really great puzzle. I love that at the beginning of the game, you know all your options to, to uh, build a route. And then as the game progresses, you see those options slowly dwindle. So at the very beginning of the game, you have so many different options. You have your personal contract you're trying to do. You know exactly all the different route options that are available. But as the game goes, that tension really kind of builds as the map gets kind of filled out. And so you have to start vying for space with your opponents and trying to race to certain key spots. But you also are seeing the available actions dwindle. So you don't know how you're going to be able to do it, or you really need it to come out in a specific order. And if it doesn't, you have to be able to tactically switch on your feet and make it work. And I love that balance of this. I find this game to be quick and punchy, but have a good puzzle aspect without being excessively daunting. You never feel backed in a corner like you don't have an option. It's just how do you make the best of this option that you have now and the ones that you have coming down the line. So I really enjoy that balance and kind of this re actionary route building that you do in this get on board New York and London, which is my number 93. And number 92, CO2, second chance. Now you're going to see as we go further on this list that I really like cooperative games, but I also really like heavy, very engaging and, and, and a strong cooperative nature in these types of games. So I like it when they are heavier and there is a lot of decisions to be made, a lot of results or effects that you have to balance, and it forces you to have these discussions and rely on each player's strengths. And by players, I mean not only their player, who they're being, but also them as an individual. I really think that that is some great experiences in, in different game, game groups I've been in. And CO2 Second Chance, I feel like, does this really well. This is a Lacerda game and it does have have his executive actions where you're not only thinking about what you're doing on this round, but maybe how that's going to snowball into further rounds or how you can utilize these free actions that you get or these push out actions that you get. So it's not just what am I going to do my turn, but how am I setting myself up for the future and when can we trigger that future action? And so because of that, CO2 second chance has some great difficult decisions that have to be talked out loud with the group and really worked on and tackled together. One person can't win this game. It takes everybody. Now, I do understand that this one does have a uh, competitive mode as well, or semi-co-op. I only play it cooperatively. It's the only the, the way I'm only really wanting to play it. So with that, CO2 Second Chance is my number 92. Betrayal and House on the Hill, number 91. Every time Betrayal at House on the Hill hits the table in my groups, it's epic. And that's what I love about this game. I admit it is broken. I've heard the complaints. I've seen the complaints. I've felt the complaints. I've had those play sessions that don't quite work out, but it still always feels epic. This game just excels at being tense, at being funny, at forcing this cooperation, making you feel like you're playing semi-cooperatively when you're playing cooperatively. Because in the beginning of the game, you don't know if there's a traitor. You don't know the end winning condition or any of that. So you want to work together going through this mansion and building it out, but you're also trying to kind of protect yourself and set yourself up for success. What if you're the traitor? You don't know. Those moments are so much fun and so epic that building tension when it finally breaks, it just leads to some great times. So yes, the game is broken. Some of the scenarios don't work, but I am always willing to play this game. I love Betrayal of House on the Hill, which is my number 91. And there you have the start of my top 100 games of all time, numbers 91 through 100. Have you played any of these games? Are they hits with your group? Are there any surprises on the list to you? Let me know in the comments down below, and I will see you back next week for my number 81 through 90. Take care. I'm Camilla.